Facebook gay took center stage this week after Antonio Brown went live during Mike Tomlin's locker room speech following the Steelers' win against Kansas City. Something Tomlin was not cool with. It was foolish of him to do that. Um, it was selfish for him to do that. And it was inconsiderate for him to do that. Um, not only is it a violation of our policy, it is a violation of league policy. And uh, I definitely don't want that to be his story. I'm sure he doesn't want that to be his story. Um, so he has to address these things. You got to respect how Tomlin handled that one. Mark Schlereth here with us. How we doing? I'm doing good. I also respect how Antonio Brown handled it because he owned it. Yep. You know, he used the D word. He said it was a distraction, and he apologized to his coach for disrespecting his coach. He apologized to his players. We just go back a couple of weeks to the new, uh, to, excuse me, your New York Giants, yep. right? Nobody wanted to admit that it could be a distraction. Hey, it's my day off. I can go to Miami if I want to. Then your coach has to come out and lie for you. Your quarterback has to come out and lie for you. Basically, everybody, everybody and then you're prancing around the locker room with luchador masks on. You're having a great time. Then you go out to Green Bay and you go shirtless in pregame warm-ups, something you've never done before, saying, look, it's no big deal. We've done this before. And then you drop touchdown pass after touchdown pass and third down conversion. It was a distraction. By doing this... Antonio Brown basically took all that onus off his teammates that were going to have to answer questions about, is it, is it not a distraction? He said, I was a distraction. Put it on me. Now the reporters don't have to go through the locker room going, hey, was it a distraction? Was it a distraction? Was it a distraction to every other teammate? They know. It's done. It's Two over. things about that, though. One, going on your day off somewhere is, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, very different than putting something live in the locker room on Facebook, right? Oh, correct. So, that, so that's a more egregious kind of violation of any kind of unwritten code. And in this case, it's a written code. He actually violated. Right. And two, in the end, Odell dropped the balls and they lost. Yes. Um, Antonio Brown now, it's well and good that he apologized, better ball out. Should, you know. What are your expectations for him? I, I expect him to be the same guy he is all the time. I mean, he is going to go out there and he is going to play. He's one of the toughest covers, maybe the best receiver in all of football. And one of the things you gotta love, Butler's gonna go over him, he's gonna follow him around the football field. It's gonna be a great competition, but Antonio Brown's gonna get his. He's one of the best players in the National Football League, um, and, and they're not gonna shy away from creating opportunities for Antonio Brown. So he's gonna have an impact on this game. He won't be dropping touchdown passes. He won't be dropping touchdown passes, but what they might do is key on him to sort of frustrate things. You got to remember, one of the things about being a distraction and the kind of pressure that, it's, that it applies that everybody, in my opinion, needs to pay attention to is this. When you become a distraction and you know it, you sort of feel an elevation of, uh, of, of just being compelled to step forward and make amends. That adds pressure. And then suddenly, if they trip, if they double team you, if they do the kind of things to you that forces Big Ben Roethlisberger to go in a different direction and target in different individuals, whether it be the Eli Rogers, the Jesse James, or others that may are that may be very good but can't do what you do, then ultimately that can serve as an impediment to your success as well because you find ways to try and overcompensate because you're anxious to try and make amends for what may or what may or may not have transpired. I I think those are the kind of things that you have to watch out for because Bill Belichick is the master and he may very well play mind games and he may force somebody, anybody other than Antonio Brown to beat well, you. Isn't that the that Belichick would, way? That, that right. would have been okay under it's, normal circumstances, but not right. in the game right. like when he, you he, were you know, distraction. Make right. Manningham beat us. Don't let the other guys. Eli found Manningham right. so they beat him, but he made them go to their third option. He's going right. to take away your best guy. Yeah, he always says, and they have a philosophy, we're going to make you play left-handed. We're going to take away your best options, but with the Pittsburgh Steelers, I mean, if you take Antonio Brown away, if you double team him, you play some type of trail technique with somebody over the top of him the whole time, guess what? It does it open up things for Jesse James. It does open up things for, uh, for Bell. It does open up things for Eli Rogers. So they have got plenty of weapons on the Pittsburgh Steelers side of things to get things done. And I'll tell you this, right now their offensive line is beasting people. They are playing great up front. That's been a big difference for this Pittsburgh Steelers team that's gone on this run is that offensive line has played great. So you couple that with all the weapons they have. But you can't take away everything. You double team, you're going to double team Antonio Brown. You know what? You're going to have one less guy that you can, uh, that you can bring down in the box to defend the run. 
That's that's never. Are you a good sure thing. Butler is 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 on him the whole time? Like, couldn't they they double team Antonio Brown, put Butler on the second they option, could, and they, and they've done that plenty. The first matchup they had Butler on him, not exclusively, but a lot. We'll see if he traveled. We'll see if that competition is is the way they go here. But you're right. They could go with their second corner over there. You know, they can go Butler with Brian, slot. put Butler somewhere else. Yeah, they, they have a, a million different options the way they do things. But they always have that philosophy of making you play left-handed, taking away what we think is your number one threat, which I would happen to think is Bell, right. is the way they're going to go on that. That's the way I would, I would look at them right now. But um, this is a great matchup. There is no question that this is a great matchup. I want to key in, I know you mentioned, Bell, on some of the other important players this weekend. NFL.com ranked the most important people in championship weekend, and the top five are Aaron Rodgers, Bill Belichick, Matt Ryan, Le'Veon Bell, and Tom Brady. For the purposes of this debate, let's oh. uh, let's eliminate coaches. Who is the most important player to you in of both games? Uh, for me, it's Aaron Rodgers. I mean, it, see, as an offensive player, mm -hmm. you go into a game plan and you know, hey, man, we're going to be on schedule about 70% of the time meaning it's going to be second down and six, and we've got a play for that and a design for that, and we've got a philosophy of what we're going to do. First down and 10, we're going to do that, and then third down and two, we're going to convert by doing this. Uh, so 70% of the time you're on schedule, 30% of the time things break down, you've got to have a quarterback that can make a play. The Green Bay Packers go into the huddle and they say, broken play on two. Broken play on two, let's go. And they just go out there and play street ball. And Aaron Rodgers is the guy that plays street ball with him. They just, I mean, the last play of the game against Dallas to set up the game-winning field goal, hey, just go get open. I'm going to roll out to my left. Guys, we're going to send one guy down the sideline, clear out, and then the rest of you guys just find a, find a, find a hole somewhere. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? That's Aaron Rodgers. He's the most important guy on the field. And, and, and I agree with that. But following him, they, if you, even if you take coaches away, they had Matt Ryan and not Le'Veon Bell, who seems to me to be the next most important guy in any of these games. Yeah, he's there's no question what he's doing. What was it, 158 yards in the first playoff game, 170 rushing in the second playoff game. Um, the patience that I mean, he's got to be so frustrating because as a defensive player, you're a gap control, gap control. I've got it. Here I go. Bam. And he goes, no, nope, I'm going this way. And you're like, you got to be kidding me, Stephen A. He's, the guy's a freak show. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. But I will tell you this. In terms of the most important player this weekend for me, it's Matt Ryan. Um, this is a guy that is an, a top two MVP candidate as far as I'm concerned. He's had a sensational year, but he has come up small in postseason competition. He's got a one and four record in playoff competition. He's got to show up this weekend, especially since the guy opposite of him is the great Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers has a lot working against him, but we have no doubt we'll see Aaron Rodgers. Will we see the Matt Ryan we've been seeing in the regular season? That's the most important player this weekend as far as I'm concerned. I mean, Aaron, the, the, the only reason it's not a 150-point spread is because Aaron Rodgers has played for the Green Bay Packers. Otherwise, no one would give Green Bay a chance in this game. Right, and that's the thing. They got a great chance because... Aaron. He was the greatest coach of all time. And I said that over and over and over. A guy to be able to do what he's done in an era of basketball where it's changed so much and he's been able to have a growth mindset and be able to change with the game. You know, I went from a league where it was like inside, outside. Like every time you bring the ball down, throw it to the big. You know, and then it goes to like every time down, pick and roll. And then it goes to like every time down, shoot a three. <laughs> and he's... <laughs> Pop has been able to adjust every single time and still, for some odd reason, keep those guys under the radar. I don't understand that. <laughs> LeBron James calling Greg Popovich the greatest coach of all time as he prepares to play against him for the 24th time in the regular season. That would be on Saturday night, including the playoffs. King James is 18-21 and 21 against Pop with 11 of those losses coming in the postseason. Stephen A., what's he trying to say here, LeBron? Well, first of all, what he did say was absolutely correct in my estimation. I think Greg Popovich is the greatest that I've ever seen because of the three categories that LeBron highlighted in terms of how the game has changed and evolved, and yet he's still been able to get it done while flying under the radar, while having some players elevate their level of play, and the way they stand by him and support him and swear by him is something that rare coaches have. I think, but ultimately what, Le what LeBron James wanted to say is that all of this talk about Phil Jackson being the greatest because of his 11 rings, 
folks don't know what the hell they're talking about. Because when does Phil Jackson had to make that adjustment? You got Phil with Jordan and Pippen. You got Phil with Shaq and Kobe. Then you got Phil with Kobe with Gasol and Bynum and the crew. And each time the triangle was about the focus. And so now he goes from being a coach to an executive. And Phil insists on incorporating the triangle. All right? Coaching from the stands, per se. Trying to implement and implore a system he wholeheartedly believes in without willing to adjust to the degree that a Greg Popovich and others have proven they're willing to adjust to. And when you combine that with the fact that one of Carmelo, uh, one of uh, LeBron's best friends is Carmelo, who's suffering under that stewardship of Phil Jackson, combined with the fact that Phil Jackson just annoyed LeBron a few months ago, uh, you know, with the posse comment and all of this other stuff, it is LeBron James' slick and subtle and very skillful way of highlighting who truly, truly deserves to be revered as the greatest this game has known, and his name ain't Phil Jackson. That's what LeBron was saying, in my humble opinion. Look, um, Tim, it's Tim Duncan. LeBron James said exactly what he wanted to say, and, and it was exactly on the money about Greg Popovich, wet Popovich, whether or not you believe he's the greatest of all time. Let's take the post-Red Auerbach era, right? Like, let's take the modern NBA. Whether you uh, uh, take the modern NBA to mean the absorption of the ABA teams, late 70s, or the adoption of the three-point shot, the 80s, the modern NBA, we all know what we're talking about, which has also changed over time. Uh, you can see it as the bird magic era ushering that in. That's fine. And Michael Jordan is the height of that. And, and, and this new era as, as a renaissance or, or a new height in terms of the level of talent we're seeing. Over the last 20 years almost, 18 years I guess, nearly two decades, the Spurs are over 500 on the road. On the road. Think about that for a second. Almost two decades like that. And LeBron hit it on the head. Inside out, whatever. Popovich talked about the fact that he doesn't like the three-point shot, but he saw what D'Antoni was doing, which if the league adjusts and you don't adjust that, just is kind of a parlor trick. And, and Popovich incorporated those ideas and uses them better than anybody else, whether it's inside out, whether it's you, you got four out, however you want to play, spread it out. He's always able to somehow adjust to the roster, a couple of bigs, only one big left. No, now you got guards or your, your best player is a small forward. He's able to adjust to the rules changes and he's installed a kind of organizational um, fluidity and excellence, empowering those around him to make decisions, delegating authority, and yet also always in control of the culture or, or setting a, a, a tone for the culture. And he's done all this, as I mentioned several months ago, as a mensch. He, do, he does all, it, all of it a, in a kind of a righteous way that you love. It's kind of like the argument we make, Stephen A., when I, or I talk about Bill Belichick is the greatest coach in the NFL, probably history, but if I were a player, I'd want to play for Mike Tomlin. Popovich is like Bill Belichick and Mike Tomlin. Uh, and, and, and LeBron, I think, identified what's so strong about him and whether or not he's the greatest of all time. In the modern era, boy, it's tough to beat Greg Popovich. Well, it's tough to beat him, and, and LeBron would know that better than anybody. He's faced him in the finals three times. Uh, he's lost to him twice. He beat him once, and Ray Allen came and saved the day in that game six with that three-pointer uh, that ultimately saved the day, pushed it in overtime, and they ultimately were able to survive and ultimately win game seven. Uh, but, you know, it's just everything. I mean, working with him in 2004 when they won bronze and Larry Brown was the head coach and, 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 and Greg Popovich was an assistant coach for Team USA, uh, you know, despite his acerbic tendency towards the media because of having to do the interviews that he has to do that he hates to do and whatever. Greg Popovich is a very, very good man. Uh, and, and anybody that's around him, uh, that's been around him, knows that. Um, I know that I know it because I've had the pleasure of, of talking with him on several occasions in the past because of the relationship that he's had with Larry Brown and the affection that we and love we both have for the great Larry Brown. But Greg Popovich just has this thing about him, man, where in today's day and age, Max, Max with the advent of social media, how invasive uh, you know, the, you know, the world is, 
Greg Popovich is like a force field, a shield for players and those around him because he lets you get in but only so much. He's unapologetic about it. He's dogged in his protection of his own privacy and that of the players and the organization uh, that he represents and everybody in between. And players have no choice but to respect that. And they revere this man as well they should because he's not doing it just and because to- he, it's his job. He's doing it because he knows it's the right thing to do and that's what they respect about him. We also know all know, I hope, how great Tim Duncan is. But even as Tim Duncan aged and they no longer really had a top 10 player, you know, he's never had a guy like LeBron James. And and I know there's a debate now who's better, Duncan or Kobe. At his best, we don't have to argue it, and I think we're on the same page. Kobe was a special kind of different level of talent, but, but he's never had a guy like that. Never a Kobe, never a LeBron. And as great as Duncan was, never a force quite like Shaquille O'Neal or something like that, that, and yet he's a perennial powerhouse and a five-time NBA champion. Um, you can't say enough good things about Popovich, and, and, and LeBron identified many well, of them. Just also remember that great Tim Duncan is the greatest power forward that sure. ever lived. One of the greatest centers, too. One of the greatest centers, too. Sure. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's Mr. Fundamental. Just do it.